Hello everybody and welcome to Weather Mountains. This is my tutorial Let's Play. The goal of this episode, which is episode 9, if I'm not mistaken, is to continue on what we completed and didn't, were not unable to complete in the last episode. We've begun working on our mayor's accoutrements and space. We've uh, got our military set up. We've done a little bit of surface farming now, and we've broken into the caverns. And we need to work on our traps here. So we've got a lot of things that we need to get to. These are just stonefall traps, which are nothing fancy. However, they should be enough to hold off just a basic siege. Um, up here in the overworld, uh, something that we do need to take note of and keep in mind is our faction right here uh, does want goblets from us. That is their big request, is goblets. Now, we do have more iron on this map than I realistically know what to do with, so I'm gonna queue up some fancy iron goblets for them, because I think that that would be a lovely thing to sell to them. Iron goblet. Also, our, our dwarves will appreciate the goblets as well, and uh, we're going to queue up, eh, let's just say... 60 iron goblets. We do have a good number of jobs queued up, and we do have plenty of various uh, clothing pieces and stuff that's not getting finished, which is fine. I can remove those. We have plenty of doors queued up, plenty of anvils queued up. I think I queued up a second set of anvils. Did I? No, I just simply moved them all the way to the top. And uh, so that's kind of where we're at right now. But if we go down, we broke into the caverns in the last episode, and I'm really keen on this because there's tons of cool colored materials like malachite. Uh, we also have uh, plenty of microcline, as well as other fun things for us to dig around in and discover and mess about with. So I'm very excited to get the opportunity to mess around in this cavern layer. I think probably what we're going to do is we're going to try and get down into this area and continue digging and also see if we can get some more farms down there. One nice thing about cavern layers, and you might actually notice this pretty quickly if you take a peek, is there's actually wild plants growing down here. So we have, these are all dead because of the season, but we have sweet pods, uh, we have f uh, various other floor fungus, and a pigtail. Excuse me. Um, as well as plump helmets growing wildly, pigtails growing wildly, and uh, cave wheat growing wildly, and other useful uh, resources for making into materials. So, something that is worth noting, and definitely something that we're going to have to take advantage of. We also have some more tetrahedrite down here that we can mine out which is probably going to collide with the aquifer right there, but that's generally pretty okay. Um, so what I'm going to do, actually, is I'm going to queue up some auto-mining jobs off the sides of this and uh, get them to go start digging around. Uh, our above-ground farming is actually quite successful, and uh, now that we've broken into the caverns, you can see this wonderful mossy floor fungus is growing here. Now, a lot of people talk about, oh, no, I don't like the floor fungus, so I'm going to show you a way to get rid of it if you don't perhaps want it growing. Although, I will say, the reason you do want it growing is if uh, floor fungus is growing, uh, your animals can graze there. So we could repasture some of our above ground animals onto the floor fungus, theoretically. Which is a very, you know, useful thing to have uh, a good stockpile of um, in, in, for your dwarves because, uh, you know, you want to be able to farm and having floor fungus just means that you can farm livestock underground, which is generally a pretty good thing. Uh, so shale was what we were, we were using, so we're going to let the dwarves construct all of that. I'm also going to give them another little floor bridge across. Uh, not super fancy, but just a way for them to have a little bit quicker access, even with our water wheels sitting there. Something else on the animal husbandry front. Uh, some people have been stating, is there a way to keep uh, your livestock from uh, simply not being able to lay eggs because uh, the dwarves snap them up too quickly? One way to do that actually is simply lock the doors. <laughs> Um, if the doors are locked, the dwarves are unable to retrieve uh, eggs from this these spacings down here. So if the ducks lay eggs, then they will have time to fertilize them and uh, fully grow uh, or and then hatch into baby ducklings before that becomes a, an issue and the dwarves snap them up to be cooked. Another thing that I've queued up here over here is a whole, a whole row of new bedrooms, just purely because it is something that we do need as our population grows. And I also really like just making bedrooms close to my workshops. There are some rumors about the game that are true and some rumors about the game that are not true. One of the ones that is not true is workshops do not create ambient noise, uh, at least not enough ambient noise that it bothers the dwarves. So I wouldn't be too worried about ambient noise actually upsetting your dwarves in any way. Um, another thing is we do actually have some cloth lying around and we do have cloth trousers as well as uh, uh, 
uh, cloth shirts queued up. So hopefully as that stuff gets done, uh, those few dwarves that unfortunately are unclothed will be able to become clothed. So I'm going to finish queuing up all of these bedrooms and then uh, we're going to do a little bit more military related things before we begin moving down again. So with all of these bedrooms queued up and mostly filled up with what we have, we're going to simply queue up all these bedrooms as a living spaces for these dwarves. And that queues up just 10 more bedrooms, which is actually a pretty good spot to be at. If we actually scroll down this list, it will say who does and who doesn't have quarters. So currently, the only people that appear to be unassigned from quarters is this hunter and then this dwarven child. For some reason, and I feel like this is intentional because it's been in the game forever, hunters refuse to, like, demand bedrooms, they'll, they'll just not take them. So I like to manually assign my hunters bedrooms. So now I think the next thing we need to do is we need to work on prettying up our barracks ever so slightly. So I did store stuff to be stored in the barracks and also we made this armor stockpile as well as this weapon stockpile right beneath the barracks. As you can see, there's some stuff getting piled in there and the dwarves will, assuming it matches their, their needs, uh, go and acquire better quality weapons uh, that are made out of better materials and they will also automatically acquire uh, gear that is higher quality uh, than the stuff that they are currently wearing. So just kind of a, a pro tip there if you are... Uh, trying to manage your military's uniforms. Long story short, don't worry too much about it. Unless you want a specific dwarf where wielding a specific warhammer because it's a specific artifact, largely the dwarves are relatively, and I say this in air quotes, intelligent about what stuff that they, they are going to take with them. So I appear to have used all of my chests on uh, this. So I'm just gonna deconstruct one. Sorry, Dorf, you're gonna lose a chest from your bedroom. I appear to have used all my chests, but we do actually have our armor stands already set up. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go into the uh, military section and uh, we are going to place our, some weapon racks, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, let's just place eight. And uh, we're also going to do eight armor stands and make sure that they're all in the right zone. And for some reason, I always, I am always like pleasantly surprised that they are in their own menu now. I still haven't gotten used to this version entirely yet. I'm going to place a bunch of these. And then because our mayor does need some, we're going to give those to the mayor as well. Because, you know, we want the mayor to be relatively happy-ish. See, I always go into that menu. I, I don't know why. Um, we're also going to give him a weapon whack and a second weapon whack. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four five six, seven, eight. So now when they uh, are off duty and no longer training... Um, that they will put their stuff there. And now we can see this. Uh, was frustrated after a lack of decent meals for too long. Right, we need to make more meals. But generally, like, if you peek at your dwarves thoughts when they're training, you know that they're a good fit for the military when they when it looks like this. You know, when it's just like, absolutely phenomenal. Like, super goddamn happy. Like, that's what you wanna see. You wanna see dwarves that are super satisfied and excited and happy about training. I mean, look at this one. Uh, was satisfied about, wait, where, where were you? It was pretty decent drink and, which one did I click on? Content after a pretty decent drink, uh, content after a pretty decent meal. That's what you want to be seeing. You want to be seeing that. Now, I mentioned uh, uh, temples uh, previously, and we started building this space down here for a mayor, which I definitely spaced on. I realized after I finished recording the last episode that, oh, I did start building that space for a mayor down there, but it's fine. We can use that for the captain of the guard. A lot of these rooms are very replaceable, and we're going to need to set up a captain of the guard pretty soon because the number of dwarves in this fortress that we have is growing, and once you get to like 60, 70 dwarves, you want to make a captain of the guard anyway. So while we're doing temples in this episode, we're also going to queue up our captain of the guard. Um, but now what we're going to do is we're going to make a dining hall for our, uh, oops, not, not set as a multi-zone. We're going to make a dining hall for our mayor here. And it's going to, it's going to be a split zone. It's going to be a partial zone. I've lots of people ask me why I put the walls in them too. It does increase the value of the zone ever so slightly, especially if you then go and do this and put engravings on these walls, which is what we're going to do to increase the value of this room for our mayor and keep them as happy as possible. Shout out to the guy here who gets the bonus uh, value increase because the walls are covering it. Um, so that's going to help. And then we can go into chairs and tables and we can give them a couple tables. And we can go into chairs. Just make sure that you only assign one chair per table. Otherwise, uh, if multiple dwarves run into the same space to grab food, I should put statues in there. It's more uh, old habits. Um, and I think that we're out of pretty much everything else except for that. Sweet. And I think I was actually going to put that over here. So we're actually going to put that over here. Uh, and that, that should be everything for that. So they should queue that up and that should keep our mayor 
mostly satisfied. I mean, like, yellow is fine. I mean, obviously, they would prefer nicer stuff, but it just kind of is what it is. So next thing we're going to do is we're going to jump up to the surface. And we are going to add in some more stone fall traps to this. So we did this once before, if you remember. It's quite simple. We're also going to take a peek at this. Looks like they did harvest our rope reeds, so we need to get those queued up. Um, that we should set up a repeating job for. Uh, we're going to uh, go and jump over into the traps menu. And we are going to add more stone fall traps. So once again, stones are going to be hooked up to these. And they are going to drop big old rocks on the heads of things coming through. Just make sure if you do use stone fall traps that they are either in a one tile wide room or have a big wall, like holes on either side because most skilled soldiers are pretty good at dodging out of the way of stone fall traps, which is why you kind of want to make sure that they can't dodge them as much as possible. All right, so the next thing you want to be doing, or the next thing we, we want to be doing, is we're going to be working on those temples. Like, we <laughs> talk about it all the time. And this is practically a water temple as far as I'm concerned with the amount of, uh, you know, liquids around. Now, I, I really like this area down here that we've just dug out, especially that it's surrounded by this cavern layer. So I think this is going to be where we're going to designate up our temples. Although I think I'm going to do it over here mostly so that I don't need to worry about digging underneath my own thing. So we're going to wait until these miners get down here. Although I'm going to increase the priority because I've got a bunch of mining jobs right now, which they're probably busy with. Uh, combine that with a bunch of other repeating orders. While we wait for that to get dug out, we're going to jump up to here and we are going to go to our, our farmer shops and I'm going to queue up some uh, processed plants orders because I know that I have rope reeds now because we planted them. And then they're going to get those replanted for the end of the summer. So we're going to jump back down. We're going to jump back down. I'm going to go, okay, miners, where are you at? Well, okay, so a lot of them are busy, right? We also don't have that many miners assigned. So I'm actually going to jump over here and we're going to assign a couple more miners. Um, mining is a pretty popular job among dwarves and it's also a job that uh, some dwarves get rather obsessed with and then uh, have a hard time doing anything else. Uh, it's a good job to give to peasants, too, as it's a good strength trainer, which makes them quicker at hauling boulders and doing other things like that. So we'll, we'll, we're going to assign a couple more of those jobs. Also going to cut through this last bit of water here. And then what we're going to do is we're going to queue up a good couple of buildings, because I'm not actually sure how many gods are in this world. Now, these, these small temples don't have any value requirement. However... This can happen with both guild halls and temples. Guild halls and temples can be demanded, and if they demand one, then immediately they have a value requirement. It's usually 2,000 initially, and then they will up it to a higher value requirement later. But uh, if you have your economy set on hard, uh, they will have higher value requirements. So kind of keep that in mind uh, when you're setting your difficulty settings. So we're going to kind of move up and around here and we're going to place a couple of these and they don't have to be too big. They don't have to be too small and we don't need too, too many of them. Maybe uh, half a dozen or so. So that's what, five. Let's go a little higher up here and let's wide widen this out a little bit because I like my funny my funky shapes. We're going to queue all this up, queue all this up and do that. And we're going to do that and we're going to do that. And we are going to expand more of this, more of that. I really like this cavern layer. I'm really happy that we hit this. Also, that is curious. What layer is this? Minus 12? Holy crap. Okay, so... Hmm. This is exciting. I need to channel into this from the layer above. So this right here is some hidden fun stuff. I don't know how dangerous this is going to be, but uh, my curiosity is getting the better of me. We're going to let them dig out these uh, temples, and then we're going to go poke that and see what we can find in it. Um, those red squiggles right here mean that there's lava, meaning there is lava right there. There is a lava tile right there. But there's also some extraordinarily valuable gems, so I would like to get those extraordinarily valuable gems out of there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to let them dig this whole area out, and then uh, we will assign these temples, and then we're going to go poke that. So while the dwarves were digging this out, another dwarf completed an artifact. The butcher has created Muthor Khan, a hematite bracelet, and offers, offers it to the Rampart of Raining. Well, we should go take a peek at that bracelet while they're digging all this stuff out, because this fortress is starting to get a little busy. 
which I'm a big fan of. Artifacts are one of those things where they are definitely worth looking at, but it's also quite easy to uh, just kind of pass over them if they aren't a dwarf that you are immediately attached to. And now I'm not finding it. Where did you make it? Oh, I see. It's a craft dwarf shop. Interesting. So I'm going to take a peek at this. Uh, so this hematite bracelet, all craft dwarf ship is of the highest quality. It is encrusted with cushion hematite cabochons and is decorated with alpaca wool and encircled with bands of rectangular hematite cabochons. This object menaces with spikes of iron. I think this is a beautiful little artifact, and we're going to give it to our captain of the guard that I'm about to appoint, because we did say that we would do that in the last episode, and, well, might as well, really. Now, nobody really fits the job description of this particular dwarf, and it's a hard job to really pick a dwarf for. You need somebody who enjoys beating others, which is, um, a little tricky. So I'm gonna actually give it to, I think, uh, this presser here, because I don't really want a dwarf that's going to be super strong, and I'm not super picky about who gets this job. As for artifact, well, they can have this Mithor Kon assigned to them, and also perhaps, uh, well, I was, I was going to suggest we could do this, but I think we're, we're going to let them have this ring. This is going to be the ring of the captain of the guard, uh, and this essentially gives them a happy thought, gives them a good mood, and also now a reason for us to make them an office. So we're going to real quick give them this. We're going to real quick give them a table. And we are going to uh, realize that I now need to make more stuff for the proper uh, accoutrements, but we can give them the, the cabinets that have since been made. And I think we made... I did not queue up more chests. Uh, so let's queue up uh, the things that we're going to need for his office, and uh, then uh, I'll continue speaking. So things that we can still make is we can make a uh, weapon rack, weapon rack. And we can do uh, armor stand and armor stand, and we can give him another bed. Uh, so this is going to be the bed for the captain of the guard. This is going to be the office for the captain of the guard. The captain of the guard also needs a bunch of jail cells that are assigned to them, and a dining room, of course. But for this, we're just going to be going with uh, the bare minimum. So we're going to give them the office and the bedroom. Although I wouldn't actually consider the bedroom a bare, bare, bare minimum. Just it, just the office is the is the bare minimum. But uh, we're going to do that. And we're going to assign their bedroom. And we're going to give this to him directly. Of course, he already has modest quarters. But now he has slightly nicer quarters. Uh, he still wants a dining room. And uh, is still quite upset about the fact uh, that he doesn't have a, a chest yet. But I did queue up some chests. So we just need to wait for those to be made. Um, then lastly, I'm going to queue up a little space uh, back here at a slightly lower priority because we're still digging out all those temples. And this is going to be for the captain of the guard. It's going to be his little dining room area. Although, yeah, it's a little small. Let's actually make it a little bigger. What's going on? We got an alert. Uh, oh, hey, an elven caravan has arrived to trade. We should definitely trade with them. Although, maybe not. Maybe this time we will uh, pass on trading with the elves because I'm looking at what we could buy from them and it's probably just going to be food and items uh, of that sort. And I'm much more concerned with getting these temples functioning. So what we're going to do is we're going to begin assigning these temples. Set the first one up as a meeting room. We're going to accept it, and I'm going to set it as a temple, a brand new temple. So as you can see, there are two different types of temples here, right? And the last one that we did at the very beginning of this series was just to know specific deity to get the bare minimum of worship out. But we have a bunch of other gods. We have Idor the Livid. We have Reg the, the Cradled. Uh, and we have Turin the Great Fate and Tubal and Asmil. And you can see the number of worshippers. And then down here are religions, the renowned doctrines. Ooh, there's a lot of worshippers of, of the mountains, thunder, volcanoes, the sky, the sun, the wind, and, and uh, fire god. That's a pretty badass god. Idor the Livid. Very livid. Um, this is probably going to request a specific location sooner rather than later because they already have eight worshipers if 10 total worshipers from this religion end up in our fortress or get converted in our fortress then we will need to make them a specific temple which is exactly the same as making a normal temple but you need to give the temple 2000 uh money value as well as a priest so a bigger slightly bigger room with uh some chairs and tables a couple statues and maybe an altar something to make them a little bit happy but we're not going to worry too much about that right now uh there are some other religions down here that aren't very well represented including the cult of dents i guess denting things uh but we're going to just focus on the popular gods so i'm going to look at the ones that have more than like two worshipers and we're going to go with them so igor the livid uh reg the crate the cradled uh talron the great fate and Tubal, Asmil, and uh, Doran, the Crystal of Turquoise. So we're going to just start off with the Livid, so that they can have their room. We're going to queue this up to be smooth when they have time. And we're going to 
then once it's smooth, place a door in. We're also going to queue these two up to be smooth, and we can get these two done as well. Now, of course, you can go back and check, but it is very easy to forget which door, which uh, temples uh, are assigned to which room. So what I would recommend doing is just simply doing them in order, which is how I do them. So it's like, one, two, okay, how many have I done? All right, we go on to the next one. Uh, Reg the, the cradle is going to go here. Um, and I should actually just make this fit all these balls. And um, now it does. And then we can queue up another one, which is going to go over here. And we're going to, again, make it fit all the walls. So this is going to go to a another temple. Now, something uh, that is worth noting while you're queuing up a bunch of temples is by default, temples are set to public. So you're going to get a bunch of visitors walking in. If you don't want the visitors right away, definitely don't set them to public. So you get to that menu by clicking on the little magnifying glass here. And then you click on the uh, citizens and long-term residents only. Or you could just say citizens only if you don't want long-term residents in there. Now... The reason I like to do this until I am I have a fully set up fortress is because if there's were creatures in the area or vampires in the area or scary things in the area that may want to hurt me, I want them to um, not be able to do that. And a very easy way for them to do that is simply walk into your tavern, steal your artifacts, and do all that sort of thing. So I'm going to wait until at the very least we have about 100 dwarves before I start letting visitors in, just so that it's easier for me to immediately identify and, and deal with threats when they appear, because we will have more stuff set up. We also have a petition there that is ready to go, but uh, first I would just like to see if my captain of the guard has stuff set up, which he doesn't yet. So um, we'll check this petition, I guess. Oh, look at this. Uspu uh, Glutton Dungeon uh, wishes to reside in Weather Mountains for the purpose of eradicating monsters. Well, what are you, Glutton Mountain? I like your name, but uh, what are you? Uh, goblin Axeman. Well, that's good. The nice thing about Goblin Axeman is the goblin here uh, r it wears the same size clothing as dwarves, so we wouldn't need to worry about him getting upset with clothing. As for stuff he's got equipped, what do you have? Uh, he's got a Bismuth Bronze Battle Axe, which is currently strapped to his back because it's not showing in his hand and uh, a bronze shield. Well, it's pretty unarmed aside from that, aside from some iron boots. Something that's worth noting is if you ignore your mayor and you do not do not set up a space for your mayor to live, the, this can't happen. This can only happen if the mayor has an office and they actually go into the office and petition to live here. So I'm gonna allow this little goblin to join our fortress because while I don't really want visitors, I'm too, totally okay with having a happy little goblin living here. So good luck, Gobby. Uh, enjoy the tavern, um, enjoy the free booze and Hope we'll have to make you a place to stay, I think. Uh, he is annoyed when caught in the rain. He's remembering that. But uh, goblins are, are neat little critters. We can actually see where he came from, too. So former member of the Youthful Terror. That's definitely a goblin sieve. And uh, is a former member of the Hex of Fortunes and a former member of the Umbral Sin. Um, but seems to be an, a member of the Labor of Muscles and um, a member of the Ordered Tomes. So if this little guy here lives here for one year, then uh, we can then assign them to join our military and do other things because they can petition for full citizenship. And once they have full citizenship, they're just one of us. But uh, I'm going to let them finish digging all this out, and then I will continue speaking. So right as I said that, it looks like some migrants have arrived. Well, that is good. We do have plenty of beds available. I don't know how many they're bringing, but hopefully it's more than two. Uh, although, fortunately, it should queue up this job a little faster, so... Uh, 69, nice. 70? Are we 75? 75 maybe? maybe? This might actually go up to 80. Something that you do need to check whenever you do get a migrant wave, though, is uh, jump up to wherever your uh, pastures are and see what animals they brought with them, because they probably brought something that's going to starve to death in your tavern. Uh, not too much. Not too much at all. Not so far, anyway. Although they tend to arrive at the end. It looks like we're going to hit 80. Up, oh, 79? 79? 79. All right, so we're now up to a population of 79, which I'm sure will speed things up quite considerably. It also means that we have some new peasants around, which means grab a pickaxe, dwarves, because you're needed, <laughs> frankly. We also have this legendary soap maker who I'm suddenly kind of interested in. If you ever see names flickering, it does mean that they are legendary in a skill. What are you legendary at, actually? Legendary soaper. Are you actually a legendary soaper? That's impressive. So with that, this is the final temple that I'm doing for this zone, and I am going to once again set it to citizens and long-term residents only. Keep in mind our little goblin that we just recruited does count as a long-term resident, so he will be able to use these if he wishes. So we can now queue up all these, and queue up all these at slightly lower priority, just to make sure that they all get smoothed eventually. Now, onto that fun tile. So we have this fun tile right here. As you can see, once again, it does have lava marked on it. What we're going to do is I'm going to go right above it, 
which is right there. I kind of put a little note there. I'm just going to dig a little tunnel. Dig a tunnel. Dig, dig a tunnel. So I have this um, annoying obsession where I refuse to have any hard angles in my fortress. This bothers some people, but I like it. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to kind of go up and then around, and we have another petition. Looks like we have a guild that we need to put together. It's a farmer's guild hall. So many members, uh, uh, the, the Hall of Dunes has many members in, uh, and now requires a farmer's guild. So we can put together our first guild while they dig that out in the corner. So because we have a bunch of farming right here, I think this would be a fitting spot for a farmer's guild. Surprise. Uh, so what we're going to do is I'm going to dig a little room out down here. And it's going to be accepted. Now, I've had a lot of people ask me this. Is there a way to see petitions that you've accepted once you've accepted them? Currently, no. Which is actually, I think, a QQL feature that I think this game greatly needs. However, what I will say is once you've agreed to a petition... We have another one here. Once you've agreed to a petition... Uh, and if it's a guild hall or a temple, the only temples that can form into guilds are the ones that have 10 members. So when you're assigning it, just look for one with 10 members. And generally, at least I am relatively good at remembering which ones I have, or you can actually find the full list within the location screen. We have another person here who wants to, uh, uh eradicate mo monsters, who's a Singed Farm, who, um is a human bowman. You I'm going to decline. And purely because humans wear different size clothing and I don't feel like making clothes for you. Uh, let's see if we have more uh, plant cloth that can be queued up, which we do in fact. Would you look at that? Glorious, glorious. We can continue our above ground farming operation. We can also check on our clothing uh, and, and see what we have for cloth actually up here in the cloth menu. Uh, so let's just take a real quick peek. Uh, actually, let's just type in read. Um, here, which should filter this down. We've got tons of rope read, which is great, as well as uh, underneath thread. we got rope read thread, and uh, let's just jump over to the cloth screen again and see what we have for rope read cloth. We may have already used all of it, actually. I think we probably did, because uh, as far as I know, we still have a bunch of clothing jobs queued up in the work orders up here. We do, in fact. We have cloth shirts and trousers queued up, so that's a good sign. I'm going to let them dig this out, and I'm going to let them dig this out. Uh, well, they've already dug it out. So what we're going to do now is we're going to channel into this thing. Although, before we channel into this thing, just for safety's sake, in case something really scary comes out of it, I'm going to put a door right there. Uh, because sometimes you just, you got to be a little, you got to be careful. So once a door is here, uh, we're going to channel this out and see what's down there. So once I have the digging tool screen up, you can actually see those little squiggly red lines indicating that there's lava present. And this is right in the center here. So we're gonna, just going to channel this out and see what we get. I'm going to channel this out at the highest priority, and I've been doing everything else one below, so it should get done pretty quick. Now we just need to wait for a dwarf. And hopefully we don't find anything too scary. Now a feature that was just added in the most recent version of the game is the ability to move the game forward by one turn at a time. Uh, because Dwarf Fortress works on a tick system, just like a lot of traditional roguelikes, uh, we can actually literally hit a button to move the game forward one turn at a time, and by default it's bound to the period key. I've rebound it to equals, whatever works for you. But we're just going to keep hitting this, and there we go. Well, it looks like it's full of lava. Okay, so what we're going to do now is I'm going to channel down right above here. You see this? And this is going to cut this layer, as well as this layer out, allowing this lava to spill out here into the caverns. So we're going to do that. And then I think we're just going to put a cork in this. And then we're going to pop out here in a little bit once it's all drained, and dried up and mine those gems out. And there it goes. So now it spills out safely. If we were to just mine into the side of this, this lava probably would have killed the dwarf that mined in. Very dangerous little situation, that. But we've been able to remedy it. So now that we've got this set up and we've got this handy dandy little entryway, we can actually use this as a way down into the caverns. I'm gonna make a little walkway down here, in fact. And uh, we're going to, I don't think I have any actually, but we should queue up a trap door for this. A little hatch cover, yeah, let's do that. So we're gonna queue up a hatch cover. So we're gonna queue up, uh, let's just say, Five hatch covers. Don't actually need that many. Just a couple. And uh, that should pop us down into here. And we can begin mining out these fun tiles. This is also going to give us direct access to the caverns, which we need to be a little careful in, because if we're not careful, we may run into uh, people who don't really want us moving in. So be careful with the amount of stuff you do in the cavern layers. They can be a lot of fun, but they can cause a maybe potentially unwanted amount of fun. Um, 
Although this particular cavern layer seems pretty safe, uh, just purely because there's actually not that many ways down. It's just this one little route down here. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm just going to run over here, and I'm going to quickly throw a piece of wall right there, just so that nothing except for larger creatures can really vault up these cliffs here, which is actually quite handy. So I'm just going to make sure that a dwarf gets this placed before something else gets here. Oh, never mind. I've already got dwarves running around. Uh, oh, I see, because there's also a spot over there. Well, that's fine. We'll just have only a single way in. What I can do, though, is I can place some more of those traps that we were talking about earlier once we get more mechanisms built. We could put some cage traps right there and some other things to stop uh, the more scary stuff from getting into in its way. But uh, we have these fancy diamonds now. we got to mine through these and get all these cut out. We could also potentially go further down and see, is there anything beneath it? Might as well take a look. Why not? I mean, we're already here, right? Fortunately, this lava is not going to spread anymore. It's just going to dry the ground up and become ashes. There's still a red spot here because there's lava right there. Let's just see if there's anything else down here. Why not? Usually these spots aren't entirely isolated, but I mean, it's still worth looking, no? Well, maybe that is it after all. We're going to let the dwarves run around in the caverns a little bit because as you first discover them, they're not super threatening. I, I mean, they might get threatening, but we do have a military. So in the case of a forgotten beast or something truly horrifying, we can pretty easily deal with it. Uh, we're now going to jump over to our gem cutting shops and we're going to queue up another round of cut gems because I want them to get those gems cut. Those are valuable. Let's see how many dwarves need beds since we got that migrant wave. And then after that, we're at, ooh, quite a few need beds. Okay. Um, I'm going to queue up another row of beds down here. And um, once I'm done with that, uh, we'll continue with the video. So while they're digging that out, and something I should mention is this area here is connected via a little walkway there. Uh, we're going to queue up some stuff for our lovely, lovely, lovely cop, uh, captain of the guard, who's going to be uh, managing legal uh, in this fortress. We're going to get this all queued up here. And then what we're going to do is we're going to give them a door. Uh, right here, and I realize that I've kind of screwed this doorway up a little bit, so I'm going to place a little spot right there. This is going to be dining room for our captain of the guard, and then we're going to need to set up prison cells for our captain of the guard, which I think we're going to kind of do up on this walkway right here. So prison cells don't need to be that big. They don't need to be that small. They need to be as big as you want them to be or as small as you want them to be. The uh, importance with cells is just simply having enough and having them ready. When crimes are committed, if you don't have a cell built and you convict them, which we'll get into probably a little bit later, you got to keep in mind that if you don't have a cell set up, that conviction will be uh, void and they will simply uh, get a beating instead of getting their proper conviction, whatever that may be. So what we're going to do is we're just going to place some ropes in these rooms with doors in front of them. And then we're going to assign them as jail cells, uh, dungeons specifically, which is a small zone, which can be done like this. Uh, and then they will just simply use this automatically uh, as part of the jail system. So let's queue up a second one. You used to have to do this super fancy-like, but now it's super easy, and that's it. So we have two ready and more to go if we need them, and uh, also it looks like their dining room is all set up and good to go. So what we're going to do now is we're going to give them their tables, and we're going to give them two chairs, and these numbers are just purely random. The more items that you put into the room, the higher the quality. The only real mandatory thing is that the uh, that is that they have access to all of the different uh, the, 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 the different uh, furniture types that they're demanding. As long as they have access to all of that, then they are good. I guess the last thing we can put in here is two armor stands, which are uh, not things that they're requesting, but things that they really like having. Look, if, look at him, he's sleeping over there. Uh, so now we can give him his dining room. And then finally, maybe he will be satisfied, at, at least for a time. Um, we can now pause the game just slightly and go, all right, where's our captain of the guard? There you are, Mez Mebzith. Uh, so let's see, is he satisfied? More or less. Uh, mayor's still not super satisfied, though, wants chests and a cabinet. So let's just jump over to our mayor's room up here. And we are going to place two cabinets and two chests. Uh, and these should make him happy once th once he's realized that they're in his room, uh, which is going to take him a little bit. I'm going to queue up a bunch more bedrooms, and uh, then I will continue talking. So something that uh, I think that we need to note here is if you look up at the top of the screen here, 
at, since that we since we got a couple a bit more clothing in circulation, and since we got uh, a bit more in the way of um, a bedroom set up as well as those temples, we no longer have a single depressed dwarf in the fort, and our numbers have evened out a little bit. We also uh, have a little bit more jobs, or or had more jobs up and running. A lot of them have been outed, and I did state that I was going to automate the process plants job, so we're going to do that right now. We're going to go up here and we're going to go into work orders and we're going to make a process plants um, job. Not process plant to bag, just process plant. Now what we're going to be doing is we're going to be just queuing up 10. And they are going to do this job, if we click this green button, only when unrotten processable plants is greater than 10. So when there's more than 10 unrotten processable plants, they will process 10. We're going to back out of that screen. And then what we're going to do is we're actually going to zoom in right here. We're going to make a little stock pile right in, right in front of them. Which is going to go up to about here. And it's going to specifically be for rope read. So if I type in read and we go to uh, food. Although, would it even be under food? I guess not. Uh, so it would be under... Ah, of course. It's un it's just under rope read and plants. Uh, so we're going to just set this up for rope read. Now, I'm going to make sure... That, well, actually, it doesn't matter if there's barrels in this stockpile. So we're now going to just allow them to bring our rope read plants into this stockpile right here. And which shouldn't be an issue. And uh, then, from there our dwarves won't need to walk as far to get these jobs done. And of course, we, we need to wait for them to put it into a barrel and whatnot, but that will give us a semi-automated rope reed stockpile. We're also all the way into late spring, and uh, so I think at this point, it's just time to finish these bedrooms up, and then in the next episode, we'll go into the caverns and begin exploring. I do have to say massive thank you to everybody who's joined me on this ride for this entire series. Uh, I realize that in some episodes I say I'm going to do something and just don't get to it, but that's just the way of Dwarf Fortress sometimes. And I, I do my best to keep notes as to what I've covered in previous episodes, and if I recover things, consider it a refresher. If you've made it this far in, the, in this series, and you're playing along and doing a decent job, odds are pretty good, pretty good, that you're doing quite well. Remember those ducks, by the way? We got a lot of them now. <laughs> Look at that. Let's uh, unforbid these doors here. Just make sure that they're all assigned to this stockpile, which I don't think they will be. Look at all these ducklings. Now that we got a bajillion ducklings, we can go back to cooking the duck eggs and roast duck, I think, is going to be on the menu soon, boys. But uh, with all that being said, I just have to say, once again, thank you for joining me on this series. And holy shit, this is a lot of ducks. Thank you very much for joining me on this series. And apologies for not getting to everything in every episode. But I will do my damn diss. And if you've made it this far, which is what I was actually talking about, if you've made it this far, you're pretty much an expert. Like, you're doing better than most people ever made it to in the older versions. A lot of people who say that they play and have played the older versions played for a good 10, 15 hours and played a couple halfway forts, and then just kind of gave up. Looks like we've got some uh, rumors being shared from abroad. Well, that's interesting. Thank you very much for watching this episode, and uh, I'm going to continue doing it until we either get a baron or become a member of the mountain home or something. Something. Some form of royalty. And I will consider this series complete. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.